to see all of these faces, oh my gosh, <laughs> a little bit nervous, and um, yeah, so what I'd like to do today is there's so much depth and breadth with uh, the practice of nonviolent communication. I'm going to do my best to just get us all on the same page with a shared kind of foundation of understanding and vocabulary, and um, then I'm, I'm hoping that y'all can see how this can be applied in your everyday life just from this, so um, but first, I'd like to just share a little bit about why you might be interested in understanding um, nonviolent communication. And um, he mentioned, you know, the flame war is on Facebook, and it can really be a challenge to share all of these ideas about liberty and uh, self-reliance and self-responsibility and, um, and freedom to other people. It can be, it can stimulate a lot of concerns, and NBC helps us uh, see what's underlying those concerns and to connect with those and open up um, more possibility in terms of connection and understanding between us and other people who might not understand non-aggression principle or um, yeah, just liberty in general. And not only for those conversations, but for all relationships. It, it works between any human, a three-year-old and a 65-year-old, um, it's not, a, not an Eastern or a Western thing, or a left or a right thing. It's a very human practice, as you'll see, I hope. Um, so, that being said, I've got my notes here. I guess I'll just start with what NBC actually is. Um, and it's kind of difficult to articulate, but I'll do my best. I think um, the easiest way I've come to being able to explain it is it's a set of skills uh, and ultimately a consciousness, which sounds a little bit mystical, but I like to think of it as like a lens that we can choose to look through at any time. It's not something that you have to do all the time, but it can be really helpful. So it's a, it's a lens that we can look through to understand the way humans relate with more clarity. And uh, yeah, just it's, it's a tool to use to create more connection. and. Um, it's been really empowering for me to be able to, to apply this and see results in my relationships and, and with myself. It's not just relating with other people, it's understanding my own mind and why I think the things that I do and what feelings are coming up for me and where are those coming from. So it's really a great tool for self-understanding as well. Um, I do want to address something that I think is really important because uh, recently, I think in the liberty community, there's been some confusion about nonviolent communication. It's been represented in a way that I don't feel is accurate, I don't think is accurate. And um, yeah, there's some concern that this could be used as a way to manipulate other people and to kind of uh, get them to do what we want to do or uh, there's even been kind of like links to conspiracy theories and this sort of thing. And um, I just want to be clear that this is a tool or a technology, much like a firearm. It's not bad or good. It's something that we can use in the way that it was intended to or not. So a, a lot of this has to do with intention. And I just want to clear that up. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that I love questions so much. So I welcome your skepticism. I, I thrive on your questions. I really want to see like what comes up for all of you and, and to respond to that. So if at any time you're just like, what the heck is she even talking about? Raise your hand and we'll try to clear that up because I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and also, I'm gonna, it's a lot to kind of condense into 50 minutes and I'm going to do my best. But if you are still curious after this talk, please seek me out. I have business cards and a website and all of that. So. I would love to, to facilitate your understanding of this as, as best I can. So, I will, I will get started. I think I am going to need to move this with me. Um, yeah, with the basic underlying premise of NBC. And 
That is that everything that anybody ever does, or has ever done, or will ever do, and I mean anybody, from a newborn infant to a 115-year-old woman living in Myanmar, like any human being, all of their behavior is for the same reason. And that sounds kind of radical, but as a philosopher, I really love universals, so um, yeah, that reason is to meet their needs. And I hope my marker works. So everything that anybody oops, ever does or ever will do, um, or ever has done in the past, has been for this reason, to, to meet their needs. And needs are universal across human beings. We all have the same set of needs. And you'll get a list later. Um, hopefully I have enough for everybody here. And um, so that's it. But this was not what we were taught, right? I was taught, I don't know about you, but I was taught that the reason why we do things is for another reason. We do things because my circles are never circular. <laughs> um, we do things because they're the right thing to do. And we don't do things. Can everybody see this over there? Yeah. Okay. And we don't do things because it's the wrong thing to do. We do things because they're good. And we don't do things because they're evil. Or if we do certain things, we are good. And if we do other things, we are evil. Uh, we do things because we should. And we don't do things because we shouldn't. And all of these sets of ideas um, are what I like to call the realm of judgment. And, um, and I want to clear up something about judgment. There is moralistic judgment and there's value judgments. And they're two very different things. Moralistic judgment would be, um, yeah, I'm doing something because it's good or right. Um, or like, it's wrong to eat ice cream. <laughs> or, versus a value judgment, it's, I, I choose to eat ice cream because it's really delicious and, and filling, right? It's meeting my need. Um, so these are all judgments. This is why I, this was what I was taught of why we behave the way we do. Now there's another aspect to this. Um, yeah, so I want, to, I want to talk about judgments and how they can, they can tell us about our needs. The needs are all underlying this. So can anybody here think of why it might be helpful to call somebody evil? Protect other people from the influences of that. Yeah, maybe safety. People want to be safe. If we can identify the other people who are, who are evil, and we can avoid them and, and avoid harm, ultimately. Yes? It could, yeah, it could be validating my values, sure. Um, yeah, I value safety. So, so all of these judgments that we have, that somebody's good, bad, stupid, lazy, anything like that, they're all telling us about the underlying needs. And there's another element that can tell us about these universal needs, and those are feelings. And, um, yeah, so how do you feel when your needs are really met? Yeah, you feel happy, <laughs> you feel excited, exhilarated, engaged, interested, passionate, all of these things. And how do you feel when your needs are not met? Sad, maybe angry, frustrated. So there's a direct correlation there between how you feel and your values or your needs. And if you can notice your feelings as they arise in you, and pause for a moment and think about what's really important to me here, you can discover what's underneath here, which brings a lot of clarity in what I like to call um, empathy liberation, which we'll get to further along the line. But is this all clear so far for everybody? I'm hoping. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so everybody here, I think, came because they share a lot of values or a lot of needs. They, they really value freedom and choice and autonomy peace, connection maybe. I know that's why I'm here. That's why I come to 
to a community like this is because I really have a shared reality with everyone here. For community, yeah. And um, I think there's uh, an inclination for the libertarian community to kind of target these big social structures like the government. And um, I think while it's important to understand the nature of, of larger social structures, I think that's something that is not as thoroughly understood as I would like to see as that in order to have these, these social structures, we have to have individuals, right? They're comprised of individuals. And these uh, social structures that really don't work to meet our needs for choice, autonomy, freedom, safety, peace, those are um, a manifestation of each individual's mental world. And so I think it's really important for us to get clear on, on this. It's, it's, it's just, I want to get into the deepest mental structures of my mind and uh, yeah, get clarity there. And uh, because I can see that war is a larger manifestation of individual disconnection. And I, that might sound kind of weird, but I'm hoping that that's kind of landing for you. Um, so yeah, there's a direct relationship for me with personal growth and, and integration and healing of past traumas. You probably hear a lot of that in the, in, yeah, the libertarian community too. There's a direct connection with personal growth and social change. And I think this is really more root striking. If each person here can really get self-connected and aware of why they do what they do when they do it, that's going to say so much more to the world in engaging with you than if we're going against you know, everything that people see as normal. That really triggers a lot for people. How many people up here, well, what about the roads? You know, or had a really kind of frustrating conversation with someone who doesn't share your values. I think almost everybody here has, has had something like this. this is why it's kind of like a joke, right? So we're trying to relate with clarity this, this logical argument that makes perfect sense to us and um, it stimulates these emotions in other people and, and they get worried or concerned about things because they have needs too. They might, they might be worried about you know, their own livelihood or survival, ultimately. Um, so it's, how many people here want to have a conversation about how stupid you are? <laughs> You, you, okay, so there's a few brave souls here, but most people I ask that question uh, really aren't interested in that, right? So, um, I can see that, and, and even like looking back at the conversations that I've had with other people and sharing freedom, that's so important to me, uh, that that essentially was a conversation that I was having. That I'm right, I've got to figure it out, and if you would just understand my logical arguments, we could get there already, you know? You're stupid. <laughs> Why don't you understand this? You're so irrational or even evil and immoral because of the non-aggression principle, right? There can be a moralistic element to that. Um, so how about having a conversation about having more connection and having more understanding and having more flow between us? I think that, that has more potential to, to create shifts in other people's minds than saying this is the right way and that's the wrong way. Although that may be true or untrue, um, yeah, I think this is really, really striking the root. So, let me see, what else do I have here for you guys? Um, make sure I'm not missing anything. Yes, yeah, so, so this is pretty simple, right? We, we all have universal human needs. Everybody's got the same set. If we can look at our judgments, that can tell us about our needs. Uh, if we can look at our feelings, that will also tell us about our needs. And then we can communicate from a place of deeper self-connection and clarity than we would be able to otherwise. And there's kind of a four-step process to this, which um, has its pros and cons. And I think I'll share that in a minute. Uh, but what was I going to say here? Oh yeah, so it seems pretty simple, right? But it's, it's not easy. I, I looked at this and I said, oh, okay, that kind of makes sense. I should be able to figure this out. But then when I went into my relationships and um, really tried to apply this, 
it was hard because I was working against decades of, of thinking otherwise, thinking that we should do things and we shouldn't do things and people are good or evil and, and there are right things to do and wrong things to do and this is the way that my mind has been structured by the culture and so to change that really takes a lot of effort and intention and uh, yeah so I'm just thinking about also how I think most of us have probably been trained to ignore our feelings or suppress our feelings or to even ignore our needs or we've been taught that our needs don't matter. How many people here have been told to man up? <laughs> yeah. Don't feel your feelings. We don't we don't have space for that here. Yeah. Yeah, don't be needy. Yeah, how many people have a negative connotation with the word need itself? Yeah. So <laughs> You can, ex if it's helpful for you, I, I sometimes use the word values here, but I want to be clear that this is not a negative thing, it's a neutral thing. Um, what are some examples of needs? Some examples of needs, and I'll hand you guys out a sheet, but, but yeah, connection would be one. Logical clarity is a need. Um, sexual expression and intimacy and touch are all needs. Um, fun, play. Of course, food, shelter, water, and these aren't hierarchical. A lot of people will ask about um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. These are, you know, there's going to be variation from individual to individual about what their preferences are, how important certain needs are to them versus other people. Uh, yeah, so maybe I could pass out that list. Yeah, why don't we do that? But first I just want to say that also needs don't ever conflict. That is kind of a mind boggler there because we have a lot of conflict between people who all have needs. So what's going on there? Um, so there's a differentiation to make between needs and strategies. And strategies are the actions that we take to fulfill our needs. But a lot of times we go directly to strategy without having clarity about this. What exactly is it? Why are we trying to do this? It's to fulfill our needs. And we can uh, get much more effective strategies uh, if we're in touch with our needs as if otherwise. A lot of times we have kind of a dichotomous perspective, like I can either do this or I have to do this. But really there's an infinite um, potential of strategies to fulfill any one need. It just depends on the person and their preferences. So um, I really hope I have enough lists. So if I don't, just please share with your neighbor, and um, we'll start getting these passed out. Maybe we can just yeah, that would be great. Um, there might be some other things in here. Yeah, maybe we could set, send some that way too. Cool. So I'll just take a look at this list with you guys, and and see what comes up for us. Also, want to check the time. Cool. Yeah, so this is really my favorite piece of paper <laughs> on the whole planet. From an engineering perspective, I see this as a, a spec sheet to design the most wonderful life you could ever imagine. And it really, I really mean that, and I've found that applying these things, one side you'll see there, there's a list of needs, and on the other side you'll see that there's a list of feelings. And there are feelings stimulated when our needs are met and feelings stimulated when our needs are not met. And you might notice that the list of feelings underneath the unmet side is much longer <laughs> than, the, than the fulfilled feelings section. So that says something a little bit about our focus as a culture. Of course, every language has a different list. Um, and with, with different emphasis or, or I guess a balance between those which I think is interesting to think about but um, yeah so why don't we look at the feeling side if we could if everybody's got one or some people do and I'm wondering if anybody sees the word abandoned on there or how about ignored or rejected. 
will save you all some time. They're not on there. <laughs> and there's a reason for that, because those aren't actually feelings. Those are feelings combined with thoughts about what's going on. To be abandoned, somebody has to do something to us, right? That's not taking 100% responsibility for our feelings, because all of our feelings are stimulated by our needs, not what other people do, which is kind of difficult to understand sometimes, but I could, I could have two identical scenarios, and depending on where my needs are at, at that certain time, I have two entirely different experiences. Say I invite my friend over for dinner, and I really put a lot of thought and time into this. I, I, I made an awesome souffle, right? And it was just perfect, and I had to time it just right. And, uh, and my friend shows up an hour late. And the souffle has fallen. And I'm actually, I'm, you know, like just heartbroken that this has happened. And it's really not a great experience for me. Versus, let's say, I, I got held up at work the night that I had this dinner with my friend. And I forgot an ingredient and I had to go to the store to prepare the souffle. And they showed up an hour late. And it was just in time for me, right? <laughs> my souffle is perfect and I'm relieved, actually, that they showed up late. So you can see that my needs are different in those two situations. And my feelings are different in those two situations, even though the other person did exactly the same thing. So, does anybody uh, have any questions on the feeling side or any thoughts they want to share? Are we ready to kind of flip? Oh, yeah. Aren't your feelings really your choice, though? The same thing can happen and you can choose different feelings? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think that feelings are relatively involuntary and they're, they're, if we have clarity around our values and needs, that's where the choice is, I think. Um, that feelings, feelings arise as a result of our needs and values. So, yeah, I don't think I can choose or will my way out of a feeling. Um, if I feel really devastated because my family pet just died, I can't just decide to change that. I could maybe try to suppress it, but feelings to me are like messengers. They come and knock on our door for a reason, and they're going to keep knocking until you answer and listen to them. And they're there to tell you about your needs. And if you can hear that, they'll go away. <laughs> there will be relief. So. But so long as you kind of choose not to, not to acknowledge them and to experience them, I think that there's going to be some element of disconnection within yourself. Is there anything else about feelings? Why would you say, why would you not say you felt ignored if your friend was late? Okay, so why would I not say I felt ignored if my friend was late? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I because... That is, again, saying what the other person did, not how I actually feel. My friend ignored me, but maybe I'm really feeling sad because I wanted inclusion, connection, consideration, trust, any of those. Those are all needs, right? I have another question. Yeah. Just saying your friend, just saying you said your friend would feel let down, but they haven't been able to play. Yeah, I mean... I'm just saying it can change, though. Yeah, it can change. These, and I might feel, you know, 15 different feelings in one minute. It's really actually impressive. Once you get in tune with this and you get a, a, fluent, a fluency in these words, I mean, a lot of us start out with just two feelings, right? I feel happy or sad or, or fine, right? How are you? I'm fine. Is that really how you are? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of like a social nicety, right, that we go through. But, um, yeah, I've, I've done it. I've... Learning to pay attention to this stuff, I've found that, yeah, you're right, it changes depending on the situation from, from millisecond to millisecond even, and there's multiple things going on at once. We're complex creatures. Anybody else on the feeling side? Yes? To uh, address the other, the other question, so are you saying that normally you can't choose your feeling, the feeling just comes up, but if you use, if you like, use this technique to identify your needs, then you can see what your need is and then have a choice of your feelings? Yeah, um, that's, that's great. Once, once you identify your feelings, like what it is that is coming up for you involuntarily, and you connect it to your needs, you'll experience the shift. It's inevitable. You get a lot of clarity about what's really going on. And it might not be immediate, 
but but there's a whole process of self-empathy, right? Of getting connected to yourself, having self-understanding and compassion for yourself, and and connecting this to this instead of feelings to judgments. I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't have these needs. A lot of people have that, or or they should be doing something different. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll give you a tool to experience it before we go. Um, okay, so let's flip over to the need side, if we could. And I'm wondering if anybody sees a new house on this list. <laughs> or how about a super sexy libertarian girlfriend? Probably not. <laughs> Those would be strategies to meet your needs. So this is a really important distinction. There's a lot of confusion around that, but yeah, I don't also see bacon on there. I, I know, I can't believe it either. <laughs> we might need to change this. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering if there's anything coming up for you around needs. If you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer them. And then I can go ahead and give you kind of a process to, to, to utilize, to apply this. Doesn't look like anything. Okay, so, I don't have an eraser. <laughs> but there is a four-step process, which we call O-F-N-R. And the O stands for observations. Okay, and observations are really important to differentiate between evaluations or what we think about what's happening. Observations are what a video camera might be capturing, right? Specific, factual observations. I saw you walk into the room and set your dirty socks in the middle of the floor versus you're a lazy slob. <laughs> Two different things, right? So one would be an evaluation of what happened, and the other is a, is a direct observation. So we're in alignment with reality here, which I'm imagining is really important to everybody in this room. Um, so the next thing, F, maybe some of you are already guessing, is for feelings. So we can connect these observations to how we feel or what, what's coming up for us when we make these observations. I saw this person come into the room, put their dirty socks in the middle of the floor. I'm feeling really irritated and annoyed because my need for order is not met. <laughs> so, yeah, the next one I wish I just went to is my needs. So if we can make a clear observation, connect that to how we're feeling. You might be feeling irritated or annoyed about the dirty socks because we have a need for order, maybe consideration, maybe like help. <laughs> Uh, or maybe it's something else. Maybe this is kind of like an ongoing thing. It's just like the little camel, or the straw on the camel's back. That uh, This is uh, bringing up other things. And then after we get in touch with our feelings and our needs, this is the time to make requests. Requests can be made both of ourselves and to other people. So... A way this might look with the dirty sock situation is, hey George, when I saw you come into the room and put your dirty socks in the middle of the floor, I was feeling really annoyed because it's really important to me to have things in a certain way, to be orderly, and, and I work really hard to keep the house clean. I just really love support too and your consideration here. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to put your socks into the hamper instead. That would be the request. Now, this other person might not be willing to do that, right? So then what happens? There's a differentiation to be made between requests and demands. And the way that you can make a distinction between these two is, how willing am I to hear no? If I'm not willing to hear no, it's probably a demand and not a request. So. Choice is really important to me, and I would love for all of you to have choice and everybody else in my life to have choice. So, this
this is important, to really get clear before I make a request that I'm cool if this person isn't willing to do that, right? Because uh, otherwise it's going to stimulate conflict, likely. Hmm. So this is, this is the four-step process of NBC, how it's typically taught. There's a, this can be kind of limiting in a sense. Uh, this is really, for me, this is a path to a consciousness. And I, I have like some trepidation even saying that because there's some element of like mystical, you know, like really valued rationality and being in alignment with the reality. So uh, when I say consciousness, I just mean that this is, a, this is a perspective or a way of experiencing my life. And yeah, so does anybody have any questions about this? Nick. Off is very um, mechanical or very um, process oriented, and not it, to some people, it doesn't sound like you're actually talking to them. It sounds like you're, I don't know, you're just speaking a process to them, right? You're not actually empathizing with their situation. Yeah, yeah, so there, this is a common thing that comes up with this kind of process. It can, it can, other people can experience this. One, it's unfamiliar. Who talks this way? Who says, hey, when you do this, I feel this and I need that. Will you do this? Nobody usually does that. They say, what the fuck, dude? You put your, oops, sorry. They put the, <laughs> they put the, you put your socks on there again, and you know, like, you're such an idiot. Uh, gosh, I <laughs> didn't mean to do that. Uh, but, but yeah, so this is one, unfamiliar. So when you start speaking this way to somebody else, suspicion <laughs> happens. They're like, what's going on here? Are you, like, psychologizing me? I don't really understand this, you know? And um, yeah, so need for trust might be coming up for them. And uh, also I think that because this takes so much effort, so much consciousness, like uh, you really have to focus your awareness on noticing these subtle things because of our habits, like right what I talked to you that talked to you about, uh, that we were trained to ignore our feelings and needs. So it can take a lot of kind of bandwidth, right, to, to think about. And it can, the conversation can go at a slower pace, and, uh, and yeah, just, yeah? yeah. Well, it would be true to say as well, though, that thinking and feelings are processes in themselves. Yes. And each of them is caused for consequences, and it should be mindfulness of all of those. Yes, I want to be mindful about my thoughts and, and my feelings and my needs. And I'm not, I also want to be clear, I don't think thinking is wrong or bad in any way. <laughs> Thoughts are really valuable. Our thoughts tell us a lot about our feelings and needs too. So uh, again, that would be a total contradiction, right? To say like, should and shouldn't isn't helpful, but you should do this. I don't think that, I, I think this is a choice. This is a tool that I can use. It's not something that I have to do or should do. I think that's really important because, yes? First of all, I gotta say, I'm sitting here laughing at myself because like I'm a landlord. So I say I see cigarette butts on the ground. I'll yeah. say, dude, oh, do me a favor. There's other people who live here. And I use logic. And I've been told I need to use nonviolent communication in dealing with these situations. What happens when you come up against the person who says, well, those are your feelings. I'm not responsible for your feelings. <laughs> yeah. What do you do Well, the whole point behind this is it's at a deeper level, right? What you, what you need to do is you, you need to observe just get out of the whole situation, go and observe your resentments within you, right? If you can clean out all your resentment within you, right, then that person holds the upset within themselves, right? That person what? The, the person that, what, what you're saying here is, is something, what, what you have to do, you take it to a deeper level than what you're talking about here, right? Because the subconscious, whatever's in the subconscious <laughs> mind, Whatever the subconscious mind holds, the superconscious mind will give that to you in a bigger and better way, right? It always, the superconscious mind always gives you more, bigger, and better than your conscious mind can ever figure out how to give, even if it's in something bad, right? Sure, there's a big, there's a, there's a whole, I don't want to go into that because we've got like 10 minutes and I'm going to answer your question. I, you're going somewhere there, but I really want to just answer this, that I, one of the key distinctions of NBC is that we are 100% responsible for our feelings. And other people are also 100% responsible for theirs. 
and um, and we don't want anybody to have to or should do anything about our our feelings and needs. So in in one way they're right, um, but but it's curious when you're in this role right of playing the landlord, and you guys have an agreement I imagine about how the property will be treated. So they're responsible to upholding their their commitment there. I think, and that doesn't really have much to do with how you feel about it. That's that's what they signed on the dotted line for, right? There's a contract. And it's logic does still have a place in this. Absolutely, yeah. And I think ultimately this is actually logical. Um, people think that feelings aren't logical or they're somehow contradictory with logic, and I think that's absolutely not true. Um, feelings happen because of our values. That's all it is. And our values, if we have clarity about what those are, logical clarity about that there's no no confusion there for me that this is yes I have a trick question uh oh <laughs> the, the non-aggression principle or requester then okay is the non-aggression principle a request or a demand I suppose uh, it's neither I think it, I think it's just an explicit statement about the value for peace choice and autonomy well but you can choose to not associate with somebody if they're going to address you. So yeah. In that sense, it's kind of a demand. Well, you can say if if you don't fall, if you don't also value the the NAP, then I'm going to choose to dissociate from you and and ostracize you, and and that isn't really a demand. That's a boundary. Thank you for asking this. Yes, this is an important distinction between demands and boundaries. Okay, boundaries are really important. This isn't about kind of. Um, sitting on my knees and and um, yeah, just always being nice. That's that's not it at all. My I I take responsibility for my feelings and 100% for my needs. I am my own biggest advocate to get my needs met, and that means I don't want you know people crossing my boundaries. So the the trick there. Oh my gosh, I'm forgetting how to articulate this in the most clear way. Give me a minute, I'm going to come back to this and answer this question, but I'm going to revisit this. Yeah? In response to what he was saying, the easy way out is to find the need of the other person and figure out how you can satisfy that and satisfy your own cuisine. Yeah, so, so the person who's leaving the cigarette butts on the property has needs, right? They're doing that maybe they're just for ease or whatever. They're not they're not really thinking of or holding your needs in equal weight, right? But if you can connect to how they're feeling and what they're needing about the situation, go through the process of, of empathy. There's there's something called empathy guesses where um, you ask somebody about this. Say, hey, I noticed that you left those cigarette butts on the floor. Are are you feeling X because you're needing Y? Would you be willing? So that's, that's the formulaic way of saying this. I think it's really important to kind of do a lot of this in your head at first, um, just simply because, yeah, it is so unfamiliar and, and kind of strange to people. But uh, I hope that maybe clarifies some things. Uh, are there any other questions? Yes? It's not really a question, but it, it seems to me that it's, uh, talk about request or demand, um, it seems to me it's a request until it butts up against a contract. And there's probably a contract involved there. And uh, once, you know, if it if it gets um, stressed enough, that would seem to be my out. What does the language say in that mini constitution that you you formulated? Yeah, the contract in essence is a boundary. I think you know, and it's something that both people voluntarily entered. Hopefully, um, that that yeah, like. These are my needs in this relationship, and if you violate that, or if you go against our agreement, then this will be the result. You know? Uh, yep? Sometimes it's not a contract, it's not an intent. Like, I was looking out the window, and I watched a guy sit in the car in front of my house, just flinging a cigarette butts on the sidewalk. Yeah. And sitting there reading the paper. And what I did is I went out and I said, you know, dude, I don't know if you realize this, but those butts go into the storm drain, mm -hmm. and they go right out to the river, and poisoning the fish and the birds. Yeah. So I went for the empathy that way, not, you know, don't be an asshole and throw your stuff in the ground, but I tried to show you the, the reason underlying to his action 
that he may not have thought about. Yeah. And I live right near a river, so it was real obvious. So. Yeah, that's a possibility. But Did he wasn't my, I, think I don't have the right, I don't have the social contract with this person. Right. So I can't fall back on that. Yeah. Yes? Why, you know, this uh, imaginary situations uh, speak about your emotions uh, at all? Because you can, uh, for example, say, we have a contract, uh, put down your cigarettes, or I don't know, please, could you make the sock, socks out of this, out of the center of the room? Why we need uh, the F part at all? Why are feelings important? In this, I, no, 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 not why our feelings matter. I understand it. But okay. But uh, as the lecture is uh, non-violent communication, yeah? Yeah. And well, why we need uh, to speak about our feelings in this communication? We can say our observations need the request, and I don't see many differences here. Yeah, you don't necessarily have to say all of this out loud. It's more about having the awareness in your own mind uh, that, oh, I'm noticing that I'm feeling this way, and it's probably because of this. But you don't have to say, like, I feel really frustrated right now. That might be implied in the way that you communicate about it, right? So that's where this gets kind of awkward because a lot of people don't go around saying that. Does it? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mary. <laughs> you can start to sound kind of formulaic if you're always doing that, just, you know, in the, in the same way. You're saying. you can also kind of get set up like, hey, dude, when you threw your socks on the floor, I, I felt kind of irritated. You know, I, I like to keep this place clean. I work really hard at it. And that's a really, you know, quick way to do my thing that I'm going to It's a quick way of kind of bringing the whole thing and not quite sounding as formulaic and like you're reading from the book. I mean, but, but yeah, identifying it in your own head and realizing what your your own feeling is is definitely the most important thing. Yeah, I thought that's a good thing. Yeah. Yes. A time factor is this. I was thinking of an example of you ordered at a restaurant and you're looking forward so you have positive feelings or to be having a need to fill and after a half hour goes by, now you're in dissipations and it's just back to a negative feeling. So I don't I'm not sure exactly where I'm going with this. Well it changes moment to moment yeah. in relationship to the same situation, right? Yeah. Conversation and I don't care. Yeah. It just depends. Anybody else? No? Yes, Stephanie? We could do a role play. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody have a situation they want to try? <laughs> the cigarette buds? <laughs> do you want to? Yeah. Okay. I'll be the guy who's just sit sitting outside smoking, and you can be the person in the audience, the landlord. Does that sound good? Yeah. And and I'll do uh, the this formulaic version, just so we're really clear about that. I smoking here. Cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> would be throwing it on the ground. Keep leaving the roaches on the ground. Oh my god. Where are you going? Roach problems. Just chilling out here, smoking. Okay, so first thing that I'm going to do, I notice this person is smoking. I'm not going to say anything yet. I've made my observation in my head. I see this, this woman smoking a cigarette and flicking her butt onto the ground. That's my observation. I'm feeling really annoyed right now because I really value having a safe, clean environment, also considering uh, the other people around us. And this is all something that's going on in my mind, right? I'm just becoming aware of what's going on for me. I'm not saying anything to her yet. And I'm thinking about, okay, so I'm feeling frustrated because I have a need for, you know, consideration, a clean environment, uh, maybe just a shared reality about what's actually going on here, like what she's doing. And uh, so is there maybe something going on for her too? Like, like, yeah, I'm feeling like I just want to chill out, relax, not have to worry about where I throw my cigarette butts. You know, I work really hard at the end of the day. I just want to be able to smoke freely and, you know, kind of express myself. Yeah, so the other half of this internal process is me imagining what's going on for the other person. And that's what empathy is, right? To put myself in the other person's shoes and to imagine what their feelings and needs are. And so once I practice self-empathy, getting connected with what's going on with me, and then I imagine what's going on for them, then I'll be ready to, to move forward and engage with her, perhaps. You know? Or maybe not. Maybe I'll choose to just walk away. <laughs> Depends on how much time I have in this sort of thing. So, 
I probably, you know, I'm not really thinking much about a contract or anything like that. And even if we did have a contract, it's not absolute. It's not going to stop me from, uh, from smoking. I think people violate contracts all the time. So, but if you were to come over and say, hey, I see you're just chilling out there and, you know, just, just relaxing. Um, I was wondering if you'd be willing to, could we put a coffee can here or something that you could throw the butts in? Maybe we could work this out because I'm just noticing that they're all over the property and I don't like the way that looks or smells and I'm concerned about the fish. Would you be willing to maybe throw your butts in this can? Or could we come up with another solution? Versus, yeah, I see you smoking here and, and just being a total jerk and throwing these all over the floor. Don't you know that you're killing all of the fish in the ocean? <laughs> Screw you. <laughs> I don't care about the fish. Yeah, so that's going to be a different thing. If I come to her with my judgment about how wrong she is or how wrong what she's doing is, she's likely to get into defense mode, right? And to defend herself and her character and why what she's doing isn't wrong. As opposed to, if I can see it, like, hey, it's pretty relaxing out here right now, isn't it? Yeah. Just chilling. Looks like you're really enjoying that cigarette. Yeah, it's really good. American spirits. <laughs> oh, American spirits, yeah. My mom smokes this. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I noticed that there were some cigarette butts on the sidewalk out here, and I'm, I'm kind of concerned about that because, you know, some, something that I've read is that that can really impact the environment when they go down into the storm drain. And I know you're probably not thinking about that, but I was wondering if I brought out maybe a coffee can or a bucket that uh, you would be willing to put your cigarette butts there instead. I would feel, you know, much more at ease and relaxed if you'd be willing to do that. But if not, I'm open to other suggestions. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I would be totally willing to do that. I didn't think it was a big deal. I'm glad you said something about it. I would have never known that it was any kind of a problem. I'd be happy to put them in a coffee can. Thanks, yeah, I'll, I'll bring one down a little bit later this afternoon. Sounds good. See? <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, I don't know. Saying like, oh, you stupid <laughs> how, to, how to argue on the internet without calling people status? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that can be really difficult, right? But um, a lot of times these conversations of, um, revolve around strategy, right? That people see the state as a strategy to meet their needs, and they're not recognizing kind of the gun in the room, or that there's there's a violent, it's a demand, right? It's not a request. So. Um, my approach is to first check in with myself about it, do I really just want to prove this person wrong or do I really want to connect to them and understand what's going on for them and hopefully that will segue into them understanding what's going on for me. Um, if you're coming from a place of like these people are so illogical and stupid, wrong, bad, evil, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Does does this allow for the potentiality? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but this is how I live in Portland. This is how it is. This is how people react all the time and everywhere. Using guilt. Yeah. How, how does that fit in with this? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if guilt is on the feelings list. If it is, it's there just because it's easily accessible to people as an experience there. They're used to saying that. I meant using it in that situation where you're not you're not overtly judging the person, mm -hmm. but you utilize yourself to produce guilt in them. You've already solved your problem. You're going to bring a can. Okay, you've solved it. They're yeah. not solving it for you. But you can guarantee that that person is never going to put that butt outside that can. If I use guilt, um, I, I'm not responsible for other people's feelings. I have no control how they feel. Guilt is coming from a should, shouldn't thought. Yeah. Like, I shouldn't do this. Or I should, yeah, so you like their shoulds and shouldn'ts to achieve a mutually satisfactory result that doesn't make them feel judged. Yeah, for me that's not it. It's it's what I really want to do is create connection with them. I don't want to utilize their feelings in a way to manipulate them into doing what I want. That's not what this is about. It's about getting connected with our feelings and needs. And I feel this way and I need this, and they feel this way and they need that, and uh, not trying to influence them to do what I want in any way. I want them to be totally free. 
to do what they want, right? I don't want anybody to do anything for me out of duty or obligation. Um, I want to check the time. You're out. We're good? We're going to have to. Oh, we got to go. Okay. All right. <laughs> so that's it. If, if anybody has questions, you can find me on Facebook, Delilah Declare. Send me a message. Come up to me if you see me. I'd love to, to support your understanding in this and clarity in this as much as possible. And thank you so much for coming and, and all your questions. Dude, dot com.